Hello, everyone. Welcome to the MIF Plus Plus seminar. Today, Professor Daniel Rigdon from the University of Liverpool. Uh, he will talk about tertiary structure assessment at CASP 15, the last one. Please, Daniel. Okay. Good. Well, um, yeah, well, thanks for inviting. This is obviously a very informal setup, so it's probably good if we just sh shout out questions as we're going along, I think. And I've got loads of slides, but the last ones are maybe less interesting. So if we don't get to them, that's also fine. Um, so, yeah, CASP 15. So I should say before I get us started, this was a big group effort, all of these people. So I'm going to start by talking about a little bit about CASP, a little bit of the history. A little bit about CAS 14, which was the previous exercise, obviously, because that's where Alpha Fold 2 came along, which has driven so much of protein structural bioinformatics since. Then Vitaly asked me to talk about some measures of uh, protein 3D structure accuracy. Some of these feed into what we use to assess groups at CASP. Um, and then go into the CASP 15 results themselves, um, which groups did well, what methods they used. Spoiler alert, it was mainly AlphaFold. Um, what targets are still hard and why, as far as we can tell. Uh, and then some more detailed sort of thinking about whether disagreements between the predictions and the crystal structure are actually errors or simply differences of opinion, if you like. And then at the end of this time, how we can take some of these predictions forward for um, crystallography and cryo-EM. Oops, sorry. There we go. So CASP is critical assessment of protein structure prediction, and it's essentially an exercise every two years to see, take the temperature really of how well protein structure can be predicted by groups across the world. So what happens is that people who are determining structures for real with methods like crystallography and cryo-EM, um, they offer then new as yet unrevealed structures to the CASP organizers before they put them uh, in the PDB. That means that this is a kind of blind prediction that the people predicting structures for those proteins have never seen the actual structure. They're simply working in a very real world sense with what's available uh, in databases and what they can do in terms of their structure prediction. So the groups get a few weeks to submit up to five predictions. So um, what I'm talking about here, this is one part of CASP where um, we're trying to predict single chain protein structures. Sometimes those single chains are divided up into what's called assessment units. Um, so there may be several domains linked and uh, for the assessment we split a, a single chain into distinct units um, often those units will correspond to a single protein domain but sometimes they're bigger than that and sometimes there's no need to split it at all because the groups are doing so well predicting the whole structure of a, a chain and then as was just saying before there's different um, CASP exercises in predicting complexes between multiple chains, RNA, ligands and so on. I'm not talking about any of that, I'm just talking about where it all started really, which is single chain prediction. Um, so this is a little bit of, this is a figure from John Moult, who's the main guy behind CASP. Um, uh, and this is a kind of historical perspective through the different CASPs, they're numbered, and they're, obviously they're in chronological order. And this is how well, using one method, we'll talk about the definition of this method a bit later on. This is the model quality, so high is good, and uh, versus the target difficulty. And basically by difficulty here, we mean, was there some similar protein to the target already available in the PDB? And in very easy cases, the answer is yes. And you could see it by sequence similarity. In slightly harder cases, the answer is yes, but the sequences were very different. 
And then the hardest of all cases are what's called what they call free modeling. So the easy cases are template based modeling. You perhaps know the term template from homology modeling, very sort of old fashioned way of producing models. FM is free modeling, which means you're trying to produce obstructure prediction when there's nothing similar at all available, simply by looking at the sequence and whatever you can do with the sequence. Um, so the history is that, of course, in the beginning, homology modeling was worked well for easy targets, you get good models, but free modeling, also known as ab initio modeling or de novo modeling, was basically a complete failure in the beginning. And for many years, it was very difficult. Um, you couldn't do much with these hard cases. Then at CAS 14, um, there was this huge um, um, increase in performance. That's when the original um, alpha fold came out. What we now talk about as AlphaFold is AlphaFold 2, but AlphaFold 1 was a very interesting program in its own right, and that did very well. But of course, the big excitement was the next time uh, with AlphaFold 2 coming along, and it outperformed the next best method by a long way. And you can see that even for difficult cases, it produces very good models, and the, the gradient of this line is very shallow which means that they're almost as good as the easy cases over here. And that's why everyone was so excited at that time. So that's that's the history up to CAS 14. So 14 Alpha Fold, came, Alpha Fold 2 came along, super exciting. Um, I want to, this is a, a figure from the Alpha Fold 2 paper. And I want to just introduce one concept on the back of it really, um, which is this covariance here. So. Alpha fold two, it takes a sequence. It looks for templates. Um, so it looks for similar structures in the PDB. Um, it can use templates where it finds them, but believe it or not, it often does almost as well without the templates as it does with. And that's because it uses the MSA um, and it uses the MSA to calculate this covariance. So this is the other kind of key source of information. And it's um, just want to explain covariance because I come back to some of the related concepts a bit later on. So <clears throat> um, imagine you've got a protein. Imagine there's a contact within that protein that's really important for the protein function. So maintaining that contact um, is really important and there'll be natural selection ensuring that. And what that means is that for those two residues making the contact, perhaps you can change one, but only when the second one simultaneously changes. So imagine if you've got a big residue here and a small one here, if you sort of <laughs> mutated this one to a big residue, maybe there's no space, protein explodes, evolution selects, organism dies, etc. But if this one becomes big at the same time as this one simultaneously becomes small, then there's a kind of compensation, there's a correlation, um, there's a linkage that emerges between these two positions. So I'm representing here a, a multiple sequence alignment, here are the two positions that are close in 3D. And if this is an important contact, those two positions will start to co-vary with time. Does that make, make sense? Yep. Yeah. And um, the reason for the past 10 years or so that this has become super important is that when you have a nice deep MSA, we've got lots of sequences, diverse sequences, a deep variable MSA, you can get rich information here about lots of pairs and then by satisfying those pairs you can fold up the protein and so you'll notice that there's no reference here to anything in the pdb there's no template this is simply based on analyzing sequences on a large scale and getting that covariance signal and it turns out that so alpha fold uses this um, we know it uses this one interesting side note we don't know how 
because AlphaFold has learned with this whole deep network some way of extracting and exploiting this information. We know it's important because we can take it away and the modeling is not as good, mm -hmm. but we don't know exactly formulaically how it works with this information because it's all hidden in the network, which is kind of interesting. But th this is still very important information and that's why I'll come back to it later on. That's why I'm introducing it now. Um, do you think it would be better than if it was sort of less of a black box and we could actually understand the sort of physical yeah. behind that? Yeah, it would. Yeah. It would. Yeah, I mean, it's something more interpretable would be <laughs> obviously easier to interpret, right? I mean, yeah. so when, when you, you know, when you store the alpha fold failed, you'd be able to look in the black box and figure out in much more detail why rather than challenging it in different ways and simply reading what comes out of the black box. So, yeah. It would be better. Um, so it, it has this arrangement. It has it can do recycling. I'll come back to that a bit as well. So by default, it does three recyclings. It produces an initial model that pr produces some kind of restraints on what the possibilities are, which you can feed back in another recycle and produce a better model. And then the only other thing to say here is that AlphaFold gives you three bits of information. It gives you the coordinates, which are the most obvious ones, but it also gives you accuracy estimates. And that's this coloring here, blue is good, red is bad by convention. And it gives you the third one, which is often overlooked, this PAE, which tells you in larger proteins how confidently it is about packing large blocks of structure together. Um, is this error a uh, single number or is it per resident per atom? The PLDDT? Uh, no, no, when the PAE. Oh, it, it, it's a matrix of predicted alignment errors. So it's N against N if N is the length. And it says for residues X, Y in this matrix, I'm either very confident that they are the distance apart that you see in the model, or I'm less confident, or I have no confidence, and it's kind of color-coded. Distance between alpha carbon atoms? Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, alpha carbon, yeah. So, yes, it, it, yeah, it is, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, How does that sort of tie with, like, the actual, I don't know, that, that's the model's own confidence in itself, yeah. I suppose. But well, I, is that I think, I, I think I'll show you. Yeah, I'll show you that in a bit, actually. Okay. It, it is a very good estimate of its yes. own accuracy. So a little bit on scores, just as requested. So um, there's lots of different ways of uh, giving a score to a prediction and saying, so it's got a good score, it's a good model, so it's got a bad score, it's a bad model. And the reason this is not trivial is that, and, and this is something that has encountered historically, you can produce a beautiful model for most of a protein, but if you've got a long loop profoundly wrong, then conventional measures like RMSD suddenly shoot through the roof and it looks as if you've got rubbish. You know, you've got six angstrom RMSD, whereas in fact you've got most of the protein with a 1.5 angstrom RMSD, but a loop that's 20 angstrom, which is very unfair. You need a, a mechanism that recognizes that you've got a large proportion of the model correct, even if you've failed with a little bit. So that's where these other measures come in. The one that's used as part of the scoring by CASP is this GDT, Global Distance Test. So for this, you make alignments between the model and the reference structure, and you try to maximize the number of residues uh, which are within, uh, which are aligned to a certain RMSD threshold. So you say, okay, I can align 20 residues of this 100 residue protein to within one angstrom. I can align 30 to within two angstrom, 70 to within four angstrom, and 90 to within eight angstrom. And then you kind of average these and get a score. Um, Daniel, so GDTP1 is an inducive number here. Yeah. Yeah, the P here is an, an, an angstrom threshold. So it, this is P1 is saying for one angstrom distance cut off. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so so this is a weighted combination of integers. Yes. Right. Uh, and then it is somehow uh, scaled to 0, 100. Well, I think it comes out. These are all percentages. Sorry. Ah, so it, so it is naturally comes out. To, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is what they used initially, and because the modeling was getting so good, there's now this variant where they use low thresholds and, uh, to distinguish between excellent models. So this is on a scale of zero to 100. If you've got the fold roughly right, so you get about 50. And if you get above 90, you start to be in the territory where that model is as good as another experimental structure, the same protein. So that, that's a, a slightly subtle point, but if you determine the same, the structure of the same protein in two space groups, for example, two different crystal forms, mm -hmm. there will naturally be some differences between those two crystal structures. And so the GDT between two crystal structures might be 95. So if your model has a 95 GDT, it's as good as it can possibly be really against that kind of thinking. Um, <clears throat> and then this is the TM score, which is reported by CAS, but not used in the scoring. It's kind of similar, but more complicated. Uh, I can't, I'll be honest, I can't quite get my head around that, but that will be meat and drink for you guys, I know. All I really know is that above 0.5, again, this is from zero to one, the above 0.5, you've got the fold approximately right. And this has some other advantages in terms of not, you don't need to define a threshold, which can be a bit artificial and cold. Um, so th these are both global measures. And then if you say, okay, I've got the backbone right, then you need to say, what about the sort of packing and the context? And that's where this local difference, dis dis distance, different test, LDDT comes in. This is important because this is what's predicted by AlphaFold. But this is a measure of um, the LDDT itself. So you, you basically set, define a sphere around each residue you look at the, the atom pairs that are not in the same amino acid within that sphere, and you say, are they uh, within a certain threshold? It, it, if you look at that pair in the reference in the model, the difference between those distances, is it within a threshold or not? If it's within a very tight threshold there, that distance is well um, predicted in the model. If it's not, it's not. And so, over all of those distances within that sphere, you get a measure of the kind of local correctness of the packing around given residue. Again, over a number threshold. Does that make sense? I guess uh, optimal alignment is involved here, right? So whenever you have a structure and a reference. Yes. Um, but, but this is easier. I mean, I, I don't think I took note of how where the alignment comes from here, but mm -hmm. this would be a local alignment. So just over a few consecutive C alphas, I would assume, just to put the things in the same frame for the amino acid that you're mm -hmm. looking at the context of. Okay. So for, for every alpha carbon in every residue, so for every residue, we take alpha carbon atom and the sphere of a fixed radius, 15 angstroms by default. And then compare when what we have in this sphere will be optimally aligned also uh, sphere and from the, from the reference structure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So... Um... So yeah, you, you were asking before about the these PLDDTs, the alpha fold zone predicted LDDTs and how good they are. And the answer is very good. So this is the correlation between their predicted quality and the actual quality. This is from their from their nature paper. Uh, and you can see it fits the one-to-one -one line very well. I mean, it's obviously outliers, but it does do very well. 
Um, and this also, incidentally, you see the clustering up here. This is showing that in general, AlphaFold produces high quality models and tells you they're high quality correctly. Um, so yeah, so the, the, and the PLDDT comes out of AlphaFold and there are these conventions for coloring, which you'll see um, if you make your own model, you'll see this kind of blue red. If you look in the AlphaFold database, you'll see this blue orange, but the basic point is the same. They're colored by PLDDT, blue being very high. In other words, the local quality of these domains is very good. Um, and then of course there's regions of protein which are red, which means they're very low quality predictions, but they turn out, especially in eukaryotic proteins to be um, often intrinsically disordered you know, you heard of intrinsically disordered protein? Um, no, no. Oh, okay. So, so some proteins have big chunks like this one does, or even the whole protein can be like this, where they don't fold up into this kind of conventional view of nice protein domains. In fact, they're simply waving around in solution, at least until they interact with a partner. Mm -hmm. So, these intrinsically disordered regions like this, they often contain linear motifs for interacting with other proteins. Um, but in the absence of those interactions, they're just you know, innately flexible and mm. jiggling around. So this is, this looks weird. And people said, well, this is ridiculous. This is not what my protein looks like. But the truth is for an intrinsically disordered region, that's as good a representation as any of the yeah. of millions and millions of different possibilities. So if there was a PDB entry corresponding to that, I don't know. I can just imagine a scenario where another researcher would have the same protein and they would determine all the positions would be different, right? Because it's interesting. Yeah, well, so. well, actually, yeah. I mean, it's a good point. You, you would never, you wouldn't have a crystal structure of this protein because these regions, they prevent the crystallization. But you might. It's a shame I didn't show this, but this is actually... Um, there is an NMR structure of this protein, and you can see that the N and the C termini are indeed different in all of the different members of the ensemble. Mm. So this is these regions are genuinely disordered, and you see that by NMR. Um, to answer your question. Yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering about sort of like I suppose if you were given this in the competition. Um, and there's a big region of it that's just intrinsically disordered. Like, what are you trying to guess, basically? Like, because yeah, well, you 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 wouldn't. I mean, the the you you might NMR structures are a minority. Most of them are crystal and cryo structures. So, in a crystal or cryo structure, you would only see these six chunky happy yeah. domains. Yeah, yeah, the rest the rest would have been either invisible in a cryo structure, most likely, or actually engineered off in order to make the thing crystallize. Okay. So they okay. wouldn't be part of the target the CAS. In CAS. Daniel, could I clarify with PLDT, LDDT score, mm. this is um, computed simply by alpha fold. Yes. So it comes from, from yeah. a black box. So yes. There is no formula. No. I see. Oh, but it's uh, called similarly because because it's similar, right? Well, it's, people, it's, people predicted. Expect... Well, it's predicted. The P, the P is um, the P is for predicted. Yeah, yeah, but for at least for LDDT, the normal formula you have shown yeah. in the previous slide. But for this PLDDT, yeah, there is no formula. No, I see. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so that's the kind of introduction, and then the actual result results themselves. So this is end of last year, we were compiling these results. Um, so the, the scoring in CASP, the, these are scores from the previous CASPs. It's always multifactorial. So there are different elements here. Uh, I'll talk about the Z scores in a second, but these are different scores for side chains, for backbones, for clashes, for sort of stereochemical features. There's the one we talked about, the GDTHA. And this element here is how well predictors predict the quality of their own structures. So it, as well as submitting coordinates, I should perhaps have said, they predict, they assign 
estimates of quality to each residue or at this time actually to each atom in their crisp in their prediction so the predictors are giving you accuracy estimates and we assess those accuracy estimates as well as the accuracy of the coordinates and include it all in these big scores so um well yeah am i talking about the z scores yeah, I'll talk about the Z scores in a bit. So these are the, the scores from the previous CASPs. Um, these were for the easy modeling. Uh, the, the scores for the harder models were slightly different, but it seemed right to us in a kind of post alpha fold two world where we're getting excellent models, even of hard targets to, to move to the more stringent kind of scoring. So we were looking at these formulae and thinking, should we make any changes ourselves? Um, we did because there's this new um, score that came along RELOG. Um, it's quite, uh, it, hmm. it, it was designed to measure the usefulness of a model for MR, but it's also a general measure of coordinate quality in a, in a rather complex way. We, we we kind of wanted to include it because we saw it wasn't too correlated with other measures. Of course, if it was completely correlated with things that were already there, there's no point adding it, but it wasn't. And it was also where this time we, people, we asked people to give atomic estimates of PLDDT, and it was the only element that was going to take those into account. So we thought we, we probably should include it. And so we changed this element to include now Z R E L O G as well. Um, it didn't make too much difference because we, we can compare to the old scoring system. We can calculate these for the CAS 15 models and show that the scoring doesn't change too much. So this is what we used. And then just to explain the Z scores. So all of these are kind of on different scales. Um, in order to work with them, they're converted into Z scores. Um, so positive is where one group um, does better than the average of the whole groups. Um, and where the Z score was below two, then we basically um, ignored that model. The reason for that is that the organizers want to encourage experimentation. So they want to, they want people to feel confident to, to gamble with a particular model, knowing that even if they come a horrible cropper with one model, it's not going to affect their overall performance too much. So any kind of outliers, which are completely dreadful, they're not given to a massive weight in this Z scoring. Um, yeah, and then we add it all together because we want to reward groups who work on all of the targets rather than cherry picking a few targets that they think they can produce good models of. So th this what we get is a sum of um, those scores. Um, these are all now different groups. So dozens of groups entered. Uh, they're color coded here. So there's different kinds of groups, the servers and manual. So that's, that's pretty obvious. A server is simply a totally automated method. A manual one is where humans have been involved in thinking about it. And the other color coding is there were some kind of, kind of generic vanilla alpha fold runs done purely automatically just for comparison. So there's a standard alpha fold and there's also the variant called Colab Fold, you may have heard of. Mm -hmm. It's the same network. It just works with different a different MSA. Um, and then we'll come back to these as well. There's some language model methods. So some large language model or protein language model here methods. It's quite a bit of excitement about those because they are much quicker. And they were appeared to have some advantages. I'll come back to this. This turned out not to be true, but there was some excitement about these. Um, so they're colored differently. And basically the best groups are up here. And 
main messages are the best groups all use AlphaFold in some way, although they sometimes use the AlphaFold results in their own software to produce the final models or kind of hybridize in some way. Um, but basically, when we first saw these results, we thought, this is amazing. Look, all of these groups have done it better than AlphaFold because this is where we thought AlphaFold was. But all they've done actually is drive AlphaFold in different ways or hybridize results from AlphaFold in some other way. So everything basically uses AlphaFold. This is the best method that doesn't use AlphaFold. So AlphaFold still is dominating the field, you know, absolutely. Is that best best method that doesn't use AlphaFold? Um, how, I don't know the specific details, but how interpretable is that? Is it like? No, it's the same. It's a it? very similar method. Oh, okay. It's, it's yeah, Rosetta Fold. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's another deep learning method. But... What's the best interpretable method? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. No, but well, I mean, AlphaFold has taken over. Really. I mean, there will there will be other peoples, but we haven't looked at them to be honest. I mean, you, you can imagine all our attention is focused on the top performers. I, a lot of these, even you know, OpenFold, these are another deep deep learning method. This one is another one that just drives AlphaFold harder. I mean, deep learning and alpha fold have basically taken over. Yeah, but you mentioned that the interpretability is yeah. also important. Yeah. So that's why it's a reasonable question. It is a reasonable question, but uh, that, that's not one. I mean, I. So who can explain? Well, I, actually, I, I think I do know. Well, one answer to that. So, unres here. Which is this is this is a mistake that we've since corrected. It's not a language model method. That's actually a coarse grained representation of proteins. So I don't know if they fed any kind of alpha fold or deep learning stuff into their coarse grained modeling, or if that is genuinely a much more familiar kind of physics connected uh, group. What yeah. do you mean coarse grained? Oh, so coarse grained, well, coarse grained representation of protein. So, you know, one blob for the main chain and another blob for the side chain. And so coarse grained molecular dynamics, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's this coarse grained force field on resin. You can do dynamics with it, but they will have done some kind of folding with the same coarse grained force field. Mm -hmm. So it's still an optimization method. Um, yeah. Okay. So that might be <laughs> the best, yeah. the most interpretable. You can see how far down the list is. Yeah, I suppose the question is just be like, how much then, like, value in actually understanding the structures of proteins you obtain from this competition? Like, if it's just a case of, I mean, you can obviously predict very accurately at the top, but yeah, I don't know. Do we understand anything more about proteins as a result? Or than just this is a machine that we have to predict what they look like. How, how how useful it is to not make that sound question. So those predictions are done. What's next? Well, I mean, you, you you use those predictions to assign function to all of the genomic dark matter. There's millions of proteins. We don't know what they do. You use them to accelerate your experimental determinations of crystallography, cryo-EM. I'll show you a bit of that at the end. I mean, I think... That is a good thing. That it would another way to share it. So, did it help a lot? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It, it's absolutely revolutionized mm -hmm. um, crystallography. I mean, you know, so before there were various ways of solving the crystal structure. Molecular replacement was already the favorite, but you, you couldn't do molecular replacement if you had a completely new protein because you need something similar as a starting point. And so people, have been, including us, have been trying for ages with old-fashioned methods to model proteins as a starting point for molecular replacement. And sometimes that worked. Sometimes it worked with a lot of effort and faffing around. But now you have a magic wand that for most proteins produces a structure that's accurate enough. Sometimes you need to edit it and split it into pieces. And I can show you that if we've got time at the end. But... Mm, the, the sort of old fashioned experimental methods for phasing crystal structures are practically dying. There's really very few 
proteins where you need that these days. And that number's only going to get smaller. But in terms of, you know, ideas of protein structure, you know, we know that proteins are built of helices and strands. Has it, has it shown us anything radically different from that? I'm not sure it has. I mean, there is some related work showing that it, it can predict subtle details that are not present in its training set. I mean, so, I mean, this is a question people often have. Does it go outside the training set? The answer to that is very easy. Yes, it does. So mm. there's whole other folds that uh, people saw emerge after alpha fold was trained and then they went to the alpha fold model and, and sure enough it predicted them as you know quite quite weird looking things that alpha fold had never seen but it's still accurately predicted oh, so it sort of seems to model the physics in some way that we don't fully understand but yeah that it, it does generalize. another it, it's it's an interesting perspective on it another preprint came out saying um what alpha fold has actually done is learn is use deep learning to learn a physical potential because there's a whole other area of structure by traumatics which is um, programs to assess model quality where you would challenge them with models that were either very good or rubbish and you would try and find a way to score the good models mm -hmm. higher and alpha fold is brilliant at that so you don't need to just use it for modeling you can use it for scoring models from anywhere and it will tell you which ones are the best mm. so it has learned some kind of physical potential mm. but it hasn't learned it it hasn't produced it by understanding yes. physical yeah. laws <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hmm. so it seems 21 million parameters were used uh, or two yeah I, I don't have that number to hand okay. but yeah can be different the last models which think of this as so yeah interesting questions um yeah this could skip that um so these are just different ways of looking at the groups that did well um, uh, which groups got the best models by the overall score or just by the pure measure of fold accuracy and i only show this to pick out the that, that language model method and the the um the alpha form vanilla ones that do quite well that, that's just important because of course these are the ones that are accessible to people you can go to a colab page on any computer that's connected to the internet and produce a model like this and you get a good result likewise this is very quick and there's a massive massive database of them and so it's important to know that those are yeah, quite good models as well and um, this just makes the point that it was nice to see totally automated methods right at the top of the rankings that's a bit different to previously so purely automated methods do better than they used to um don't know how much have to keep an eye on the time Time to ramp. Good lord. We've been talking 40 minutes. Mm, that's extraordinary. Right. Well, I won't I'll try and be a bit selective then. Um, um yeah, this is just really setting up what we realized was that we, we've become so used to amazing progress. So everyone said, Oh, we'll plot this graph again. We should see a huge jump from last cast to this. Basically, we didn't. In fact, by some measures the performance was slightly worse so there was a, a lot of thinking about that and informally cast vast deep mind to, to model with actual with their do their best efforts so they did something and produced you know models that were as good as anybody but some targets were still very difficult and so that set us wondering why this is just an overview of um it's a kind of heat map. So what we've got along here are groups and we've got targets here. And there's some color coding of the protocols used by the groups. It just, again, shows alpha fold was very predominant. And then there's some classifications of the targets. And that only really, sh well, two things here. One is you can see this block of um, targets at the top. So blue means bad predictions. So most groups, 
do really well. Lots and lots of red. These are great models. Brilliant. But there's a small group at the top here which distinguish the best groups, which can produce good red models here from most groups which struggle with all of this blue here. Um, so these harder targets are mostly the ones that are classified as free modeling. So that means there's nothing similar in the PDB and that's no real surprise. But then the slightly more interesting thing was that there's a lot of virus targets within this hard block. And the way to rationalize that is that virus proteins mutate more quickly than cellular organisms proteins do. And that means that when you're trying to make that MSA, which you remember you need to generate for the covariance, which is so important, and we'll see that again in a second, when you generate that MSA, you find it harder to find the viral homologs because they're more different. And when you do find them, perhaps the accuracy of the alignment is not quite as good. So actually, it's, it's not surprising that coming from a virus is a kind of extra complicating factor. Um, yeah, we don't need to worry about that. So this, this is where we were trying to see what made targets hard in CAS 15 and why the performance seemed to be perhaps slightly worse than CAS 14 overall. Of course, the difficulty with comparing one CASP to another is that the set of targets is completely different. So you really, really can't do it in an easy way. All we could do was say, what characteristics define the hard targets in CAS 15? And were those same targets present in similar numbers, similar uh, CAS 14, and sort of try and produce a kind of hand wavy exercise, uh, explanation, I should say. Um, so in terms of which targets are difficult, these, there's a few graphs where the y-axis is model quality here. So these are all happy days, great models. These are the ones that basically failed because the GDT is less than 50. And the, the main problem a target might have is a low NF here. So NF is defined here, but it's basically a measurement of the depth of the MSA. So this captures that, what I was saying earlier, that for, for good covariance information, you need a deep MSA with diverse sequences. If you don't have that, then you're very likely to struggle. So you can see that all of the targets with very low MSA, very few homologs, even the best methods produced rubbish models. So this was very clear and, and no surprise again. We tried to think if other factors were an issue and it, it's hard because you don't have huge numbers here, but this is all groups, and then this is the best group. So here we're looking at the targets, which even the best groups couldn't get good models of. And it seems as if small proteins might be more difficult than large proteins. And there's a little bit of a backstory. That's a complete inversion of the, the difficulty that there was with the previous generation of ab initio software, where small things were easier than big things. So there's a hint here, of course, it's hard from this distribution to be sure, but it's true that most of the, well, all of the really bad model, all of the really difficult targets are relatively small. That's most we can say. Likewise, in terms of secondary structure, um, so things that are the hard ones tend to be all alpha or mostly alpha, whereas if it's all beta or mostly beta, we tend to do better. So there's a little bit of a hint there somewhere as well. And uh, monomers possibly a little bit harder than oligomers. So that was us thinking about why some targets were difficult. And I'll show you some examples of the difficult ones and the bad predictions. But it's also important to remember that most targets were predicted very well. And this... I think this is just amazing every time I see it. So this is a massive, huge single chain. Mm. This was split up for assessment into four units, all of them hard, pretty hard to very hard. And yet one group managed to produce a single prediction, which was ah, beautiful, right? I mean, it's 
It's fabulous. Of course, it's not perfect. The, this this red part is not right, but looks pretty it, similar to me. It's <laughs> it's awesome. It really is. So, bearing in mind there are lots of good things, what went wrong? Uh, this is frustrating because I'm not allowed to show you the structures. They're kind of kept secret, but the, these are exemplify structures that are very difficult because there are not lots of homologs in the database. Um, and even actually old style methods, I tried old style methods, they didn't work for that. Um, it's just one of, one group that produced good results. Um, oh, there's a bit of a backstory, I won't, won't go into that. Yeah. Um, this is slightly interesting. This is this is a kind of an example of a, a really weird protein that might just depress your results one year, but is not necessarily representative. So this is a, a virus protein. These crystals are very old, and but and if you look at the solvent, I don't know how much you know about crystallography, protein crystallography. Protein crystals have solvent in in a given range. These have very very little solvent which means these proteins are packed incredibly tightly. And this brings us on to something I'll come back to later, which is that where this protein is being simulated without its environment, it's kind of understandable that the model that you get might not be great. So in its natural environment, it's defined a lot by all of these neighbors in the crystal. If you're trying to model a single chain of it, without knowing what that crystal context is, it's not surprising it struggles. Um, so that's a bit of a, a weird one. Uh, we'll probably skip that. So yeah, this, this just summarizes targets that are still hard, even for AlphaFold, even for the best methods at CAS15. They're the ones that have not many homologs in the database, so you can't build a deep MSA. And they may be smaller helical monomeric. Those may be other aggravating factors. And our thinking is that at CAS 15, we just had an, an unusually large number of these problematic proteins, which combine this, which is a known complicating factor with a bunch of other aggravating factors, if you like. Um, so then we looked at CAS 15, CAS 14 to see if that explained the difference, and it doesn't really. I won't, won't go into that. Um, so in terms of different kinds of methods, that's, this is just visualization. Um, this is worth saying. So, um, so these language model methods, they're deep learning, but they're they're different, and they're they're they're, they're kind of strength is their speed. Um, so I already showed you they didn't do very well overall compared to Alpha 4, but they do produce some fantastically accurate models. This is free modeling, so there's nothing similar in the database. So again, this is going beyond what's in its training set by definition, because it's never seen anything like it to produce a beautifully accurate model. But this, this was the interesting one. If you look in the literature about these methods, they, they say, they argue that they will do better than um, things like AlphaFold, which are MSA-based methods, on proteins with shallow alignments. So where the NF is low, the argument in the literature is that these language model methods will do better. This is a kind of key claim, really. And we, we tested it by ranking the targets from high NF, so lovely, rich, deep MSAs, to low NF and saying, how good are the models? The two blue ones are the MSA-based methods. The two red ones are the language model methods. So if what was in the literature was true, these red ones should be overtaking the blue ones on the right-hand side. And in fact, what we see is the exact opposite, which is that they do reasonably well in the easy cases on the left, but they actually struggle even more than the MSA-based methods on the right. So this seems to contradict what's in quite a key paper, 
which there was actually some fuss around on Twitter at the time, but I think we can see that that fuss was justified and that claim is not really borne out here at least. Just a little side note, and it's only occurred to me recently that this isn't necessarily a totally fair comparison because there's a, a real limitation in CASP, which I think they should address. And this is why I was sending in an email to him recently, which is that people have access to different databases. So I've explained the MSA is absolutely key, right? How many homologues you can find in a line. And yet you'll read these abstracts and people will say, oh, I've, I've made a big database from this, this, and this. And other people will say, I just use this big database. Other people will say, I went to the supplementary materials and scraped a few sequences for that key target. And that can make a massive difference. But that, that just kind of exemplifies that these methods are not necessarily based on the same sequence information. So these language model methods, they were trained a certain time ago when the sequence database was a certain size. If you come along six months later and use an MSA-based method, your sequence database is perhaps twice the size it was. So it's not really a fair comparison. It's very difficult to do a fair comparison. But what I've suggested to CAS in the future is that they might want to try and, at least for the MSA-based method, say, this is the sequence database we would like you to use, because that removes another variable from the, the, the comparison. Mm -hmm. Are they surely not just all modeling on the PDB complete? No, no, th th this is about finding sequences from Uniprot or whatever sequence databases. So oh, okay. yeah, most yeah. of these targets, there's no good template, and often yeah, AlphaFold yeah. ignores the templates even when they are there. So this is this is about sequences rather than structures. I see. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that, that's not terribly important, um, the, except to say that the um, this is how good the group's assessments are. So are they do they correctly identify high accuracy and low accuracy regions within the models they submit? And the only point to make is that the default generic alpha fold does really well. I showed you that graph before with the PLDDT. So it does really well. And that's important because in the alpha fold database, which is a huge important resource these days, this is these are the quality estimates that they have attached and they are genuinely good quality. So you can kind of trust um, what's in the database and trust, oh gosh, I've run out of time. That's amazing. <laughs> right, so I've got, loads more slides but i should probably stop otherwise we'll be here all day so um I yes that uh, yeah thank you very much <laughs> daniel so let us thank daniel please. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot um okay i'll probably stop recording and then we'll invite uh questions um